this is the story of one of the greatest fighters the world has ever seen. For 12 years, this powerful right and left combination crushed challengers like no other heavyweight champion in boxing's history. As time goes on, many will claim to be the greatest heavyweights of all time. Yet no one will ever command the worship of a race and an entire country like the man they used to call the Brown Bomber. This is the story of one of boxing's best, Joe Lewis. building that you're looking at behind us is Joe Lewis Arena here in Detroit, Michigan. It was named after one of this city's favorite sons. He was the heavyweight boxing champion of the world for no less than 12 years. His name was Joseph Lewis Barrow. You know, life was never easy for Joe Lewis, even when he was heavyweight boxing champion of the world. He was born in Alabama, but he came north here to Detroit in 1926 with his mother, his stepfather, and seven brothers and sisters. Joe's real father, Monroe Barrow, was confined to the Searcy Hospital for the Negro Insane in Mount Vernon, Alabama. That happened when Joe Lewis was just two years old. He started fighting at Brewster's Gym here in Detroit, a place that we're going to be visiting a little bit later for a fellow by the name of Atler Ellis. Billy Kahn, you were the light heavyweight champion of the world. You climbed into the ring with Joe Lewis on no less than two occasions, but I'll bet you would have loved to have had him in his very first fight as an amateur. Yeah, I heard he was knocked down seven times. He was, in fact, but he said he had an excuse. He ate a dozen bananas before the fight, and that slowed him down. Well, it takes a good man to get up seven times. Well, that's what Atler Ellis said. You had to have the feeling that Atler Ellis kind of had a premonition of what he might have had in terms of a prospect with Joe Lewis. John Roxborough was a fellow that Joe Lewis got involved with as a manager, rather an unsavory type, but then a lot of fighters got involved with that type at that time. He was a numbers guy. Joe then turned professional, and Billy Kahn, he had a very good professional career. You saw him early on, and you knew right then he was really a comer. Well, the first time I saw Joe Lewis, I was about 16 years old. And I had a job putting a rosin box in his corner. And he fought Hans Berkey 10 rounds in Duke King Garden, and he knocked him out. And I knew Joe was going to be good then. That brings us to February 21st, 1935. This was a rematch of a fight that Joe Lewis had with Lee Ramage. Earlier, in December of 1934, he had knocked Ramage out in just three rounds. This one was for the money. As Joe Lewis went west to face Lee Ramage in Ramage's hometown of L.A., it would be the first Lewis fight to be seen on film. The pictures would begin to tell a familiar story. Lewis is wearing the dark trunks with white stripes. Lee Ramage in the all dark trunks. A crashing right by Lewis and Ramage goes down. The ring wise Ramage takes a count of nine. Lewis moves in, looking for a quick knockout here in round two. This is the third bout this year for the young Brown Bomber. Joe has won all 14 of his fights since turning professional just 10 months ago. 11 of those 14 wins were clean knockouts. Joe Lewis, as you can see, was all business. There was a no-nonsense attitude at all times in the ring. No wasted effort. A tremendous left hook by Lewis, and Ramage goes down. Lewis with a barrage of combinations settles the issue, it's all over. Joe Lewis scores a devastating second round knockout over young Lee Remick. I'm satisfied you're gonna be the next heavyweight champion of the world. I hope so. Well, Joe, as your manager, I'm gonna do everything possible to get you a chance to fight for the championship. Thank you. Seven months later, Joe Lewis married Marva Trotta at 7.45 p.m. on September 24th, 1935 in Harlem. At 8 o'clock, he was on his way to Yankee Stadium to take on Max Baer. Joe tries to hold on, but Maxie bores in. Now Lewis starts throwing one of himself. Now it's Baer who's in trouble. 
Carter's trying to cover up. Joe's looking for a spot to hit for a quick knockout. Bear's still caught in that corner. He's got his left on Joe's head, trying to hold him off. By the third round, Lewis has the fight completely in control. And though Bear is always dangerous, Lewis is out timing him. The ground bomber's got Bear by the ropes again. A straight right and Maxie crumbles to the canvas. Bear is trying to beat Lewis so he can get a rematch with Jim Bratta. Man, he lost his title to only three months before. But as Maxie gets off the canvas to face a devastating Joe Lewis, his chances don't look too good. Bear is very tough, but Lewis lands three left hooks to throw Max again. Once again, Bear is saved by the bell. In the fourth round, it seems only a matter of time before Joe brings the fight to a close. Bear tries to stay close quarters, but Lewis pushes him away. Watch the delayed effect of Joe's following light. Max is slumps to the canvas, and although he gets to one knee, he's not able to reach his feet. Joe Lewis was now more than a prospect. He was a contender. Max Bear, knocked out in four rounds, had trouble envisioning Lewis as a potential champion. It was a hard fight. I was up against a very good man, and a man will go a long way. I wish him a lot of luck and happiness in his marriage. Now, a little turkey talk. You know, a lot of them are saying that you might have got up on that last knockdown. Could you have, Max? Well, I'll tell you, I, in a way, I knew what was going on around me. And, of course, my legs were something wrong with my legs. I couldn't get up. And not only that, I saw more than one Joe Lewis in that ring. It looked like whole Harlem was there. <laughs> and this little ray of sh uh, sunshine, you know, he couldn't go through those clouds. Too many dark ones. <laughs> you are a happy man today, aren't you? Yeah, I'm very happy. <laughs> uh, Doubly happy. Yeah, that's what makes you more happy to be bear or to be married to this charming lady. I think to be married. <laughs> <laughs> was it a tough fight, uh, Mr. Lewis? Yeah, it was a tough fight, but I think I have a tough fight home every night. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell us about your plans, Mr. Lewis, for the future. Oh, it ain't no plan, but that thing me, I'm gonna stay boss. <laughs> Who would you rather fight, Joe, Braddock or Schmeling? Braddock. You think Braddock will be easier? Yeah, much easier than the championship, too. Oh, that makes a difference. Yeah, that makes a lot you of difference. You think Braddock will be harder than Bear? Uh, no. Can't be much harder than Bear. Mrs. Lewis, what did you think of your husband? I thought he was grand. Well, you didn't expect him to lose, did you? No. You knew it was all, all the time. How about a nice big kiss and finish it? Yeah. That won't happen. <laughs> Joe decided to take on Max Schmeling first, with demonstrations by Jewish organizations claiming Schmeling represented Nazi Germany. An overconfident and underway Joe Lewis entered the ring. A ripping right by Max Schmeling. Lewis is in trouble. Another dynamite right. Lewis goes down. The referee, Arthur Donovan, signals Max to go to a neutral corner. Joe's up on his feet, but it's all Max here in round four. Max kept pouring it on for the next eight rounds, and Joe was in trouble throughout. Joe is still on his feet here in the 12th round, but Max is all over the brown bomber. A ripping right to the jaw by Max Malin. Rushing punches by Max. Joe is in desperate trouble here in the 12. A dynamite right and Lewis goes down. Max Schmeling puts a temporary halt to the meteoric rise of the brown bomber Joe Lewis. So the almighty Joe Lewis was stopped. Maybe it was a relaxed training camp. No one knew the reason. Joe Lewis was not one for excuses. He would explain himself in the ring. So Joe Lewis marched on. Ex-champion Jack Sharkey came out of retirement, exclaiming the 12-year age difference between him and the young Lewis meant nothing. He said he could whip any black fighter. Jack Sharkey was mistaken. Lewis in the dog trunks with white stripe. Former champion Jack Sharkey wearing the all-dog trunks. 
This is Joe's first fight since suffering his only loss just eight weeks ago. That loss is indelible in his mind, a humiliating knockout of the hands of former world heavyweight champion Max Schmeling. Lewis shoots a right and Shark is down. He is hurt. Lewis, intent on getting back on the winning side, is up against the tough Jack Sharkey. Here in round two, Sharkey is in trouble. Sharkey tries to tie Lewis up. Another barrage of punches, and Sharkey goes down again. The Brown Bomber comes out for round three very confident. As a professional, Joe has had 28 fights, winning 27, 23 by knockouts. Blistering punches by Joe Lewis. Lethal left jab and hooks and rights to the body. A right and Sharky goes down. Devastating combination punches tell the story. Can Sharky weather this storm? He's up with the count of six. Lewis goes back to work, measuring his man, heading to the body and head. A tremendous left hook, and Sharky goes down again. A clean knockout by the great Joe Lewis. After the Schmeling disappointment, Lewis had rebounded against Sharky. To the fight world, he was the heavyweight of the future. In the Brewster section of Detroit, he was a hometown hero with a vision, the heavyweight championship of the world. This is Mullet Street here in Detroit, Michigan. It's where Joe Lewis lived when he and his family came north from Alabama. It, like most inner city areas, has given way to urban renewal in these past few years. In fact, the family house would probably be somewhere right in the middle of the Hall of Justice across the street. When Joe Lewis came back here in 1937, he came back a hero. He had just defeated Jack Sharkey, a man who was the heavyweight champion of the world, by way of his knockout over Primo Carnera. But earlier, he had lost to Max Schmeling, a loss that really devastated Joe Lewis. But you know, Billy Kahn, in its own way, that loss might have been the best thing to ever happen to Joe. Yeah, I think it did, because I've, it appeared to me that he was out of shape. See, in a fight business, you have to be in shape at all times. There's a saying, a third raider in good shape will beat a first raider out of shape. Not to say this guy was a, not a first rate fighter, which he was a middleweight champion. See, I beat 38 guys in a row one time, and I was out of shape with all guys, Sully Krieger, and he fixed me. James Braddock was the heavyweight champion of the world at that time. His manager, Joe Gould, was at that fight. Gould didn't think too much of Joe Lewis, and so he made the match for Braddock to fight Lewis instead of Schmeling. Oh, well, yeah, underestimated Joe. He thought he was a soft touch, you know, he's just a flash in a pan, but Joe was in shape, and that's what counts. So Joe Lewis got his title shot with James Braddock. Braddock was the underdog in that fight, Lewis the two-to-one favorite, and that was the first time that a challenger had ever been favored over a champion. Braddock was going to make $500,000 for the championship fight with Joe Lewis. Lewis would get 17.5% of the net profit. What did you think at that time, Billy? Would you have bet on Joe Lewis in that fight? Sure, I'd have bet on Joe Lewis. So the Braddock was an old man. I'd have bet on Joe Lewis. Nothing left to do except watch the fight, and it took place on June 22nd, 1937 at Comiskey Park, Chicago. Joe Lewis was about to pioneer a new era in American society. He was to become the first black man to fight for the title in 27 years. Joe Lewis was to become an idol to millions and one of the greatest heavyweights ever to wear the crown. Champion Braddock is wearing the trunks of the white stripe. Joe Lewis is wearing the all dark trunks. Joe Lewis was the aggressor in rounds two through seven and is ahead on points here in round eight. A dynamite right sends Braddock crumbling to the canvas. The referee sends Lewis to a neutral corner and picks up the count. Braddock is out cold from that ponderous right hand. It's all over. Joe Lewis scores a devastating eight round knockout over Jimmy Braddock to win the heavyweight championship of the world. At 23, Joe Lewis had become the heavyweight champion of the world. The press had to eat their statement that boxing would never again see a black champion. Joe remains soft-spoken, recovering from all the excitement. In the fourth round, I felt that I could beat him. I had him missing, and I was moving fast, and I was punching him pretty rapidly. So I, I felt sure that I could beat him in the fourth round. 
And how did you feel when the fight was all over, Joe? Oh, I felt fine. I had a tough fight, and I had a fight. I fought a tough man. When Joe Lewis starred in his first film role shortly after the title fight, it was clear his future was paved in glitter. I want to get ahead and be somebody and do things for Mama and Papa. It was also clear that his future belonged in the ring. Lewis signed a five-year contract with Mike Jacobs for four fights a year. Challengers fell one at a time. Nathan Mann was no exception. Lewis with a stripe on his trunks. More than 5,000 folks from Hamden, Connecticut, practically half the town here tonight, to root for their hometown boy, Nady Mann. You can see the concentration in Joe's face as he looks for an opening. by the bell. Now here we go into round three. Right up we're cutting left hook combination. How that Lewis can hit. Referee asks Nady if he can go on. Yes, he's going to continue. The fourth knockdown. The end was clear. Lewis was in his prime. He was confident and determined. Joe Lewis had reached every goal he had set for himself with one glaring exception, the loss to Max Schmeling. When 70,000 gathered in Yankee Stadium for the Lewis Schmeling rematch, this was more than a fight. Joe symbolized America. Schmeling represented Nazi Germany. In time, history would repeat itself. The heavyweight champion of the world comes out for round one in the dark trunks with the white stripe. Max Schmeling is wearing the old dark trunks. Since winning the world heavyweight title, Joe has defended it three times. In his last defense of the title, 10 months ago, Joe KO'd Harry Thomas in the fifth round. Max Schmeling won the heavyweight championship of the world in June of 1930, eight years ago from Jack Sharkey. Max was awarded the fight on a foul when he was hit low by a blow thrown by Sharkey. Schmeling lost a close, tough 15-round decision to Sharkey and lost the world heavyweight title two years later. Max is attempting to become the first former heavyweight champion ever to regain the precious title. Six other champions have tried and failed. wants this victory desperately. Joe is deadly serious in there. An explosive right to the jaw hurts Max Schmeling. Joe Lewis all over Max Schmeling here in round one. Ripping punches to the head. Joe steps back. A dynamite right to the jaw, and Schmeling goes down here in the first round. Max is up at the count of two. Lewis moves in. Ripping punches by the Brown Bomber sends Schmeling down again. A crushing right explodes off Schmeling's jaw, and Max down to the third time. It doesn't look like Schmeling's gonna make it. It's all over. Joe Lewis electrifies the boxing world with this magnificent first round devastating knockout over Max Schmeling. As Joe pummeled Max Schmeling to the canvas, America rejoiced and the Germans pulled the plug on the broadcast. 
as Joe Lewis climbed out of that ring in Yankee Stadium. He was the hero of the Battle of New York City. As the world erupted into World War II, Joe Lewis became the pride of a nation. When Joe Lewis defended the crown, two-ton Tony Galento proved to be an unexpected nemesis. Yet in the end, Galento's vigor only served to make Joe mad. Galento promised his friends this scrap wouldn't go beyond five rounds. When Lewis heard about it, he said, sure, but he'd be the one to end it with a knockout over Tony. Tony also said he'd murdered Joe and he called him a bum. But the bomber wasn't mad at Galento. He says Tony's just a bad old man, just another day's work. Right cross and left hook. What a power combination. Galento up at the count of two. That was the first time Galeno's been knocked down in all his 11 years in the ring. The end of round two. <laughs> Referee's been warning Galeno about holding with that left and hitting with his right. Joe by Galeno. Lewis up at the count of two. This is a surprise. It's the first time that Joe's been knocked down since he took the title from Braddock. The crowd is wild. They're screaming for Galeno to follow it up. Tony just doesn't know what to do. Galeno completely helpless. Tony drops to his knees. He's in bad shape. And the referee stops the fight. It's all over. Two-ton Tony Galeno may have regretted putting Joe Lewis on the canvas. Another man might have backed away in fright. But Joe Lewis put Galeno away. Still, Tony thought he had the champion. They should have made me, let me fight my own fight, and I should have went out and fought a rough fight. Not like they want me to fight low and be careful. I don't want to be careful. I want to take a few and get one over and knock them dead. I hit him a light punch and knocked him out. And knocked him down. I'd have knocked him out. I had him down twice. You think Donovan was right in stopping the fight? No, no, I should have knocked him out. That was my manager. I hold it. You think you had him when you knocked him down, Tony? Sure, I only had a light punch and knocked his bum down. What are you going to do now, Tony? I'm going to get in good shape and fight my own fights and listen to nobody. You're feeling how? Well, I feel okay. Look a little tired. Well, yeah, you're a little tired. Uh, does that Galento man really hit you hard? Well, he hit me hard enough to knock me down. I guess that's hard enough. Well, you got up again. On February 9th, 1940, Joe Lewis defended his crown against Arturo Godoy of Chile. The champion recorded a 15-round decision, despite his worst showing in recent years. Now round three here at Madison Square Garden. The place jam-packed for this international heavyweight title fight between Joe Lewis, the world's champion, and Arturo Godoy, champion of Chile. Joe's been getting in a few short rights to Godoy's left eye. It's puffed up quite a bit. There's the end of round three. Now here we go to the 15th and final round of this title bout between Joe Lewis, the heavyweight champion, and Arturo Godoy, the challenger from Chile. Everyone's amazed that this fight has gone this far. It'll be a great upset if Godoy goes all the way.
There's the end of the fight. And look at Godoy, bouncing around happy as can be. Here's the official announcement. The decision, winner, and still world heavyweight champion, Joe Lewis. It was a controversial decision. Godoy was demonstrative, Lewis apathetic. As the press clamored with the excitement of a Lewis downfall, Joe set out to recover his professional pride. A short month and a half later, Joe Lewis redeemed himself against a helpless Johnny Paycheck. As the world drifted into war, Paycheck found himself on the front line against Joe Lewis. Lewis, poker-faced, stolid, shuffling after his foe, Johnny Paycheck. There it is. A tremendous right cross. Paycheck can't get up again. And Arthur Donovan stops the fight as Ray Arcel ministering to him. Here it comes now. Wow. That's all. No doubt about it. Joe Lewis disposed of Paycheck early. His crown was never in jeopardy. Europe was in chaos. Joe Lewis registered for the draft while preparing for a rematch with Arturo Godoy. The Chilean had no interest in Europe, and he would soon lose interest in Joe Lewis's crown. Godoy wearing dark trunks with white stripe. Lewis in his familiar trunks with the initials JL. In February, five months ago, Joe took a 15-round decision over Godoy in defense of his heavyweight crown. This is the second meeting of these two fighters. Here in the seventh round, Joe Lewis getting off those deadly combination punches. Godoy goes down after a barrage of punches by Joe Lewis. That one knockdown slows up Godoy. Joe Lewis comes out for round eight, full of confidence. Godoy up to now has been an elusive target, fighting out of a crouch and forcing Lewis to punch down. But now Godoy is standing erect, with Lewis ripping short right uppercuts to the head and damaging punches to the body. No man through combinations like Joe Lewis. Watch as he measures his man, sets him up. Godoy in plenty of trouble. Here in round eight, a right hand, and Godoy goes down. Godoy is up at the count of eight. Now the Brown Bomber goes to work with his famous combination. Godoy trying to tie the champion up. and Godoy goes down like a ton of brick. He is hurt. The referee stops the fight, but Godoy wants to continue. His hand was trying to hold him back. Joe Lewis defended his crown for the 11th time with his ninth knockout. But as Joe began to dominate the heavyweight division, he started losing control of his private life. As Joe stepped into the ring with Max Bear's younger brother, Buddy, he was faced with problems at home. He had to plead with his wife, Marva, to take back her application for divorce. Nevertheless, none of this seemed to make life easier for Buddy Bear. A flurry of punches sends Lewis rolling from the ring rope. Referee Donovan sends Bear to a neutral corner as Lewis makes his way back into the ring. Bear moves right in. Lewis appears all right after that knockdown. In rounds two through five, Lewis landed repeatedly and is ahead in the scoring here in the sixth round. Lewis working on the inside. A jolting right and Bear goes down. Buddy is up immediately and the Brown Bomber moves in. Arthur Donovan watches the action closely.
An explosive right, and Bear crumbles. Lewis goes to a neutral corner as Donovan picks up the count. Lewis lands a crushing right at the bell that sends Bear crashing to the canvas. Bear's cornermen rush to help their fallen fighter. They say Lewis threw that bomb after the bell sounded. Lewis comes out for round seven, but Bear's cornermen will not allow their fighter to continue, insisting he be awarded a fight on a foul. Buddy Bear's manager, Ansel Hoffman, claimed Lewis hit him after the bell. As Hoffman kept his fighter on the stool, Bear was disqualified. The decision was in Buddy Bear's best interest. This is the Brewster Boxing Club, a place that just seems to be in a time warp. And this is the very ring that Joe Lewis learned how to box in. In fact, it was right over there that Atlarellis tied Joe's right hand to the ring rope so that he could learn to fight with his left hand. He got beat up pretty bad that day, but his left hand wound up being his most powerful weapon. During the time that Joe trained here, a young man named Walker Smith also came to the gym. One day he asked Joe if he could use his gym bag, and Joe agreed. Lewis and Walker Smith became fast friends. Now, you may not know Walker Smith, but you do know Sugar Ray Robinson. And right over there, well, that's Joe's locker, and it is today as it was back then. Joe was a troubled man in the late 30s and the early 40s. His wife had threatened divorce on more than one occasion. He was spending a lot of money, and he was gambling on an erratic golf game, but he just kept on winning fights. And Billy Kahn, he had a fight upcoming with you, and he said himself that that was going to be a tough fight. But he wanted to come in at less than 200 pounds, and the reason he did is that, really, you were a light heavyweight. Well, I weighed 169 and a half, and Joe came in at 199 and a half, and he didn't want to make it look too bad. Nonetheless, you took it to him for 12 rounds, you moved well, and really, you had a heavyweight championship in your hip pocket. Well, I knew that. The fellas in the corner told me that all I had to do was stay away and not point him, so he couldn't hit me. I was out boxing him, but I made a mistake. I hit him in the 12th round with a real good left hook, and he started to hold on, and I got a little excited when I got back to the corner. They said, stay away from him. Joe's corner told him, you know, he knew he was losing the fight on points. And he says, well, I can't catch him. He's too fast. But he said to me, I knew you. You had to get fresh and make a mistake. A mistake and I had to fix you. That's what happened. Isn't it funny, though, how every fighter, even if he's not a knockout puncher, still thinks he can knock his man out? Well, you, if you hurt him and he's holding on, naturally you're going to supposed to try to knock him out. That's what you're supposed to do. That's your business. They say it was one of the great fights in history, and we're going to watch it one more time. Joe Lewis and Billy Kahn. 55,000 packed the polo grounds to witness a supposed mismatch between two gallant warriors. Billy Kahn was a 174-pound light heavyweight with the heart of a champion. That night in 1941, almost belonged to Billy Kahn. Kahn is giving away 25 pounds to the man rated by many as the greatest heavyweight champion of all time. Watch this tremendous flurry by Kahn. He's in desperate trouble. He grabs Billy for support. Khan's definitely looking for that knockout. In round 13, Lewis shoots in two blistering rights in the left. He knows he's got to knock Billy out to win this fight. This is one of the greatest heavyweight championship fights in years. Watch Billy come back with a sensational flurry of punches. Khan is desperately trying to finish it right here and now. But the great Ron Bomber has other ideas. Watch him go to work on the light heavyweight champion. Now it's Lewis coming on. This time it's Joe who has Khan Doggy. Lewis lands a punishing left right combination. Khan is trying to last out the round. Watch the final six dynamite punches to the head, which finally put Billy down. If Joe Lewis had not knocked out Billy Kahn in the 13th, boxing history would have been rewritten. For Billy Kahn, this was a rude awakening. Great fight tonight. I know that Uncle Mike's going to give me another chance, and I know I can win it. I guess I had too much to win for tonight, and I tried to knock him out. With the United States now in a war effort, 
Joe Lewis and Mike Jacobs decided to donate all of their $75,000 purse for fighting Abe Simon to the Army Relief Fund. Joe Lewis was willing to sacrifice for his country. This is the Brown Bomber's 21st defense of the heavyweight crown. He won five years ago by knocking out Jimmy Braddock. This is the second meeting of Lewis and Simon. The champion stopped Simon in the 13th round in Detroit one year ago. A murderous right explodes off Simon's jaw. Lewis raining punches from all angles. And Simon goes down. In rounds three and four, Lewis continued to land punishing blows. It's a testament to Simon's courage that he's still on his feet here in round five. Simon trying to work on the inside. The referee breaks the two men. Lewis looking for an opening to put Simon away. This is the champion's second fight this year. The Brown Bomber KO'd Buddy Bear in the opening round two months ago. Simon trying to keep Lewis at bay with that left jab. Lewis lands four crushing blows that render Simon helpless. A right hand explodes off Simon's jaw and he crashes to the canvas here in round five. The bell saves Simon from a knockout. A jolting right hand sends Simon down again. Lewis moves into a neutral corner as the referee picks up the count. Although Simon wants to continue, it's all over. After the knockout of Simon, Joe Lewis did not defend his crown for four long years. As the United States fought in World War II, Joe Lewis became a sergeant in the armed forces. This is McDougal Street on Detroit's east side. With his earnings, Joe Lewis bought his mother a home on this very block. The world was at war at this point, and Joe joined the service as well to do his part, as he put it. During the war years, Joe Lewis fought some 96 fights all over the world. It was said that some five million servicemen had a chance to see the champion box. And Joe always had a heart of gold. During that time, it was not on just one occasion that when a loved one died, Joe would pick up the funeral expenses for a fellow serviceman. Billy Kahn, during those war years, you were also in the service. You were a corporal. Joe Lewis was a sergeant. And I know at one time during the war, you thought that you had that rematch with Joe that you sorely wanted. Yeah, we were going to fight for the Army Emergency Relief during the war. And uh, something happened. I uh, had a three-day pass after we signed up to fight. And I came home, and I got in a fight with my father-in-law. And I broke my hand, and they called the fight off. There was another incident that happened in Mike Jacobs' office before the war. Oh, yeah. I was sitting there talking to Joe, and I said to him, I said, man, I got a bad break with you. I could have went around the corner and told all the guys that I'm the heavyweight champion and kept it about six months. I'll let you win it back. And he looked at me. He says, you had it for 12 rounds. You couldn't keep it. How the hell were you going to keep it for six months? Well, after the war, you did get your chance. Mike Jacobs, who was then Joe Lewis's promoter, arranged the fight. Billy Kahn versus Joe Lewis. Lewis weighed 207 pounds, and Billy Kahn, you weighed, well, they said 189, and you say 180. What's the difference what I meant weighed? I didn't get there. And the folks who saw the fight afterwards said it was a different Billy Kahn than it was the first time. It's not too long. It was four years out of honest. Do you want to see this one all over again? No, forget it. Got to put you through it. Billy Kahn versus Joe Lewis. June 19, 1946. Joe Lewis squares off with Billy Kahn, uttering some ominous words to the press. He can run, but he can't hide. Billy Kahn would soon understand. Kahn, with the stripe on his front, is boxing cautiously against the man considered by many the greatest heavyweight champion of all time, Joe Lewis. Khan using that left jab at long range. This is the second meeting of these two men. Five years ago, Lewis trailing on all scorecards, rally to knock out Khan in the 13th round. Lewis has Khan cornered here in round five. A stinging left hook by the challenger. The bell ending the round. In round six and seven, Lewis continued to be the aggressor and won both rounds. Here in round eight, the champion is definitely in command. Lewis throwing torrid punches at the challenger. Khan at 177 is giving away 20 pounds to the Brown Bomber. 
But throwing punches in there with Joe Lewis shows that Billy has a mountain of courage. A right cross, and Billy tries to hold. An explosive combination sends Khan crashing to the canvas here in round eight. The referee is counting, but it's all over. Joe Lewis successfully defends his heavyweight crown against the former light heavyweight champion, Billy Kahn. After making $625,000 in the Kahn fight, Lewis had to give half of it to his managers. 81,000 went to Uncle Sam. The rest paid back debts. Joe needed another title defense. The champion decided on former sparring partner, Jersey Joe Walcott. It was almost the biggest mistake of Lewis's fighting life. Lewis goes down from a crisp right to the jaw. That's the first time Joe has been dropped since Buddy Bear turned the trick six years ago. Rounds two and three were scored evenly. Here in round four, Lewis is still looking for an opening. There's that right hand bomb by Walcott again. Lewis is taking a nine count. Joe is up, but no one envisioned that Walcott could do this to Joe Lewis. For 15 frustrating rounds, Lewis has pursued the clever Walcott all over the ring. The fight's over, and Lewis starts to leave the ring, thinking he has lost the decision and the championship. In utter shock, Walcott and his handlers accepted the controversial decision. When letters and telegrams flooded New York, Lewis called for a rematch to erase any doubts. On June 25th, 1948, Joe Lewis had one more point to prove. He had to settle the speculations of his demise in the first Walcott fight. For Joe Lewis, there was only one way to get something across. Lewis misses with a left, and Jersey Joe lands a jolting right to Lewis's jaw, sending him to the canvas here in round three. Lewis is up immediately. This is Walcott's second shot of the title. Six months ago, the two went 15 sizzling rounds, with Lewis winning a split decision. Walcott, at 34, would be one of the oldest fighters to win the heavyweight crown if he succeeds tonight. Here in the 11th round, it's still very close. Jersey Joe is exhibiting some fancy footwork in there as Lewis patiently waits for an opening. But Walcott must be careful. Lewis carries dynamite in both fists. His ring record speaks for itself. 20 of his 24 title defenses have ended in knockouts. Walcott gets hit with a jolting right hand. Walcott breaks away, but the Brown Bomber has him in trouble. A devastating barrage of punches, and Jersey Joe drops to the canvas. The referee picks up the count. Jersey Joe tries to clear his head after that avalanche of leather. He staggers to his feet, but too late. Joe Lewis had nothing left to prove. Apparently, it was the end of an era. When you knocked him down, did you think he'd get up? No, man, I thought when I had him, I know not when he went down, he couldn't get up. I hit him with four or five very good punches. I thought you hit him with, with my left hook, Joe. <laughs> well, man, I hit him with my right, too. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I'd like to say again that I retired. Tonight was my last fight. Thank you very much. At 34, Joe Lewis seemed ready to move on to a life of leisure. Even though the government demanded the bulk of his money, the boxing world believed that Joe Lewis would remain a retired heavyweight champion. In time, whether because of pride or money, the aging champion would return. And so Joe Lewis retired and came back to the streets of Brewster, streets that were familiar to him with familiar faces and familiar scenes. But it was to be a short-lived retirement. Almost immediately, Joe set about planning a 19-bout exhibition tour. Simply said, he had to do it. Joe Lewis needed the money. It also ultimately cost him his marriage to Marva on a permanent basis. Billy Kahn, I can't help but wonder, it must be a very tough decision for a fighter to make just when to hang the gloves up. Well, if you know you're through and you can't fight anymore, it's no use you continuing. You 
might get hurt or something, so if you owe some guys money to hell with them, just owe them and forget about it. Joe Lewis, of course, was a guy who I'm sure had to agonize over that decision. He was a man who really felt that all deeds had to be equal, that he felt he had to pay the piper. I guess you're right about that. And of course, Joe Lewis did come back to the ring, but first he took a job with Jim Norris as a promoter, and he earned a salary of $20,000. Add that to the $300,000 he made on that 19-fight tour, and you'd think that's a pretty good living. But wrong again, Joe did have to pay the piper. The piper, of course, was the tax man. Ezra Charles was the first big test on a comeback trail for Joe Lewis, but it wasn't going to be easy. The government didn't even leave him enough money to set up a training facility. With only seven weeks to train after a two-year layoff, Joe Lewis set out to get his title back. Ezra Charles had taken over Joe's vacated title by decisioning Jersey Joe Walcott. On September 27, 1950, the world awaited the return of Joe Lewis. As Joe struggled to pay off the tax man, he desperately tried to regain a style of boxing he would never see again. Joe Lewis, now 36 years of age, still stalking, still moving forward, still looking to throw that terrific right hand or that straight left jab. But it lacks its speed, its form of crispness and sharpness. Still a force to be reckoned with, and as it Charles knows it. Charles a good deal lighter at 183 and a half to Joe Lewis's 218. Joe about 15 pounds over what he usually fought at. Now we're in the 15th round. Closing moments of the fight, and Lewis knows he has to KO Ezra Charles to come up with a win. Shades of former greatness when he fought Max Schmeling and Billy Kahn and Maxie Bear, but only shades of that greatness now. The closing moments of the fight. Lewis going down gamely, still trying hard, still throwing punches at the bell. Joe Lewis had lost his second professional fight. At 36, the Brown Bomber was not the same fighter the nation once adored. He was a man torn by the pressures of debt. When do you think he really had to fight one? After the bell had rung enough and the judges had announced a decision in my favor? <laughs> when Joe Lewis stepped into the ring to face Rocky Marciano, he did it for one reason. He needed the $300,000 guarantee to pay off $1 million to the United States government. Joe Lewis was not merely fighting Rocky Marciano. He was struggling to survive. Marciano seems more aggressive now, beginning to pile on the pressure. Be beginning to quicken the tempo and the pace, making it tougher on the older Joe Lewis. Marciano seems to be landing more frequently now. Lewis looking just a bit tired. Marciano just as strong as ever. Bull-like in his rushes. A solid left, and down goes Lewis. A left hook to the jaw. And Lewis takes the count on one knee. Goldstein counting over him. Now he's up at his feet. Ready to meet Rocky Marciano. It comes plowing in. Lewis trying to hold on. Marciano trying to end it right here and now. Lewis using all his ring experience. Trying to hold on. Marciano trying to get that one punch home. Back against the ropes goes Lewis. A left and a right, and down he goes, and through the ropes on the apron of the ring. It's all over. He can't get up. He's being helped to his feet now by referee Ruby Goldstein and Dr. Vincent Nardiello, the Gordon's ringside physician, and all of Joe's handlers are looking after the former champion now. But apart from the days he's in, Joe is OK. Unfortunately, the ending is a sad one. Joe Lewis was a broken man. After that fateful night when Marciano knocked him through the ropes, Joe's options were none. He could not fight for money because he no longer had the boxing skills. The government would continue to take all of his earnings for back taxes. Yet when you think of Joe Lewis, remember him not as a fallen fighter or even as a beaten man. Think of him as the greatest heavyweight of all time. The ending was not a happy one. But the Joe Lewis Arena here in Detroit, where Billy and I are standing, was not named for the failures of the man, but rather for his accomplishments. When Rocky Marciano knocked out Joe Lewis in 1951, Lewis was suddenly a man without a job. He was also a man with a tax debt that had now exceeded $1 million. 
It was a debt that Joe himself knew he could never possibly repay. But in 1954, by act of Congress, that tax debt was stricken from the record. Billy Kahn, you knew Joe Lewis inside the ring, and you knew him outside the ring. He was a very different personality in one place than he was in the other. Oh, sure. Joe was um, a great fighter, and he was an unassuming, real high-class gentleman. Had a killer instinct in the ring, though. Oh, sure. But outside the ring, he had a sense of humor. Oh, yeah, he had a great sense of humor. You told me a story of what happened in Las Vegas. It was a time that you and Joe were in a restaurant, and Muhammad Ali happened by. Yes, I remember. It was a long time ago. We were sitting in the Stardust, one of the big places out there, having something to eat. And Clay comes in, and right away he picks on Joe Lewis. You know, he starts to rib Joe, and he says, what a break Joe got that he wasn't around in his time. He would have did this and that. So Joe looked up at him. He said, listen, boy, if you even dreamt about it, you should apologize. So I looked at Clay, and I said, how'd you like to shake that one off your rear end? He said, start laughing. He said, both of you are crazy. I'll see you later. And he walked out. Was Joe Lewis the greatest heavyweight champion ever? Well, that debate will rage, as we mentioned, as long as there is a sport of boxing. But there is no question, Joseph Lewis Barrow was one of boxing's best. For Billy Kahn, I'm Barry Tompkins saying so long from Joe Lewis Arena in Detroit. This has been a presentation of HBO Sports.